After 20 years of a problematic relationship with alcohol, Nolene now uses her own lived experience and training as an accredited sobriety coach to help people in rural, remote and regional Australia to quit drinking alcohol. A country girl herself, she understands that living in the country has special challenges when alcohol becomes a problem and you need to seek help that isn't readily available. She provides online group and one-on-one -on -one coaching and gently guides people back to a place where they are able to make informed decisions about their drinking habits and behaviour and supports them to discover a life free of alcohol without feeling like they are deprived or missing out. Nolene has a heart-centred and understanding approach and is passionate about being of service to others and providing a safe, judgement-free space. Alcohol-free since May 2020, Nolly now lives in beautiful regional Victoria with her partner. She admits to having nomadic tendencies and loves working online to connect with others, no matter which part of country Australia you are in. So here's my guest, Nolene. Oh, hello, Nolene. How are hello, you? Hello, Kate. <laughs> I'm fine, thank you. Oh, Pleased to be cool. here. How are you? Oh, very well, thank you. Yeah, getting through the, the floods here. It's actually quite sunny here, which is really unusual right now. So <laughs> yeah, you're doing it tough up that way. It's just yeah. very cold down here where I am. Yeah. Yes, yeah. So, Nolene, I have you on because of dry July. And yes. I would actually like to know your story. How did you get here? From an alcohol point of view, Kate, yeah. I suppose um, I've told my story um, several times now, but I think um, my journey with alcohol started um, probably a little bit later in life, but my 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 history goes back to when I was a teenager and I lost somebody very very close to me in a car accident um, and I was quite young at the time and um, when he died I was just a couple of months short of finishing high school and leaving home and moving to the city to study further education which happens so often mm -hmm. um, you know in country Australia um, kids leave home very early so I didn't really have a chance to deal with my grief. And, mm -hmm. but I didn't know that at the time. Back then, I was very young. Um, there weren't the resources that we have now, such as grief counsellors, such as, um, you know, therapists, mm -hmm. none of that. It was basically just, you're young, you'll get over it, get on with your life. And that was said with love. Yes. Um, so off I went. Um, but I think that whole period of having a significant loss not dealing with it and moving away from it set me up for a pattern that I carried right throughout my adulthood and it's taken me um, until you know I only just realized that in the last couple of years but that's basically what I've done all my life I have had a lot of significant losses in my life that was the only loss of somebody I loved actually passing away but I've had other losses that I don't believe I ever dealt with properly yeah so moving on you know I, I left Tasmania when I was in my early 20s I then moved to Melbourne into my first marriage um, and lost that marriage shortly after that I moved overseas so again there was that pattern of moving away um, from grief and loss and hurt and even the trauma of that by running away um, moved to Ireland via England had a couple of years in England wow. on the way took this, I've taken the scenic route yes. to get where I am now and that was and, a long way away <laughs> yeah yeah it was I had friends living in, in London so I spent a couple of years there and then moved to to Ireland where I um, met the father of my children and uh, married there so I'd moved away from Australia I'd moved away from everything that I knew and loved and I actually had my three beautiful children in Ireland. Yeah. Um, we were in business. 
and it was a storage and haulage business and anybody uh, listening from Ireland or who knows anything about uh, Irish fertiliser industries would know that it was the biggest liquidation in the history of the state of Ireland. Mm. They were, um, uh, well, we were one of their clients, I suppose. We had a, a haulage and storage facility. They went into, um, they were put into liquidation by the Irish government. And that day we lost our house, our jobs, our land, um, uh, we lost our business, uh, lost everything. So as a result of that loss, we um, literally ended up almost homeless, mm. uh, moving from rental house to rental house. Our kids were one, two and three at the time. And it was a really, really traumatic time. So another loss. That time I didn't run away. We had no money to, to run anywhere. Mm. Um, and uh, that was where the alcohol sort of kicked in. I had been drinking quite a bit before that um, when I moved, uh, you know, to, to, to Melbourne and then to London. And, and I think alcohol just snuck up on me and became a way to numb all the pain that I was going through. Mm. Uh, when we had the big loss in Ireland, I actually stopped drinking because I knew that I would drown myself because of the trauma of it all. And of course, you know, I'd had three kids under two and a half. Um, so I'd been pregnant for a, <laughs> about three years nonstop, basically. Yeah. And um, so, and obviously I wasn't drinking during that time. So, um, but as things got, you know, as things got tougher, um, I think alcohol just became the painkiller mm. but there was a period for about of about six years there from when we lost everything in Ireland to when we moved out to Australia there I go again running away from the pain not dealing with it uh, moved back to Australia and we came out in December and we we literally were you know um, three kids two adults five suitcases and not very much money arriving back in Australia and I really felt then that I was home that mm -hmm. I was safe. I was back in a place that where I knew that I was going to be okay. Um, hadn't drunk for six years and then took a glass of champagne on New Year's Eve. We'd arrived in December. A few weeks later, I had a glass in my hand, thought I was safe. No, that was a slippery slope that, that started again. Um, uh, fast forward 12 months and my second marriage um, just crumbled under the strain of everything that we'd been through. Mm. And um, so alcohol became my painkiller. Wow. As it often does so, Nolene, I know mm. a lot of my clients use alcohol as the painkiller because, you know, the loss of something, the grief of having something so major or even not major, it doesn't seem major at the time, mm. like moving away from um, uh, a country, you know, it doesn't seem major, but that's actually mm. a major thing. You've lost a whole culture, a whole lost lot of friends, and then putting on top of that, you know, losing your livelihood as well. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's yeah. just, yeah. And then, looking back yeah. Now, mm, sorry. So I was just going to say, looking back now from a safe safe space where I you know I'm um you know I'm over two years sober now and that is my work and you know I've committed my life to to helping other people mm. but so coming from a safe space I can see that um it was actually really quite traumatic what I went through mm. um you know on on several at several points in my in my journey to where I am now I've had a series of quite traumatic events that I didn't deal with other than running away from them. And alcohol, of course, is a painkiller. Um, but, you know, what, what you lose as a result of it is, is the ultimate loss, I think. Yes, that's right. Yeah, yeah. And you were actually in all the countries that have drinking as a social event. Like you go to a friend's place, you take a bottle of wine, you go yeah. to the pub to meet friends, you go to the club to meet friends. And in Ireland, oh, my gosh, like coming from. I, mean, I, I used to go to, um, um, you know, what do you call them? Like parents and friends association yes. meetings yeah. in the pub, yeah. Weight Watchers in the pub. Oh, wow. <laughs> lunch with the girlfriends in the pub. Yeah. 
everything yeah. happens in the pub. Yeah. Um, they don't have the cafe sort of culture that we have here in Australia where you just, you know, go to the local cafe. Yes. Um, so I get that. And it is really cold and pubs are always cosy and warm, etc. Yeah. But everything, when I was there, revolved around the pubs. You know, I've been back here in Australia for about 15 years now. Everything happened in the pub. Yeah. And um, it wasn't uh, a place where you said no to a drink. Yeah, that's right. And that's yeah. a big problem, isn't it? Saying no, mm. you know, or I don't want a drink. That's massive, you know, a massive thing it, to have to say. Yes, it is. And I think um, um, the, particularly here in Australia, I mean, yes, it does happen in in Ireland but I think it's very difficult now here in Australia to to say no to a drink particularly in the rural space yes. um, where it's just part of our culture and of course when you're grieving um, or when you're stressed or when you're overwhelmed or you've got something major going on in your life mm. you know normal behavior here is to have a drink yes this will calm you down yeah. this will make you feel better you know, there's, there's a reason attached to having the drink. And research shows that where alcohol is used as a numbing agent or to fix a problem, in, in, you know, in um, air quotes there, um, the propensity to then become addicted to alcohol is so much higher because the alcohol is being used to fix a problem and it doesn't fix the problem. The problem is always there. That's it's always right. still there. Yeah. Yeah. The, yeah. the alcohol just exacerbates it. Yes, that's right. Yeah. And people think that, you know, alcohol gives you this freedom, but it's actually a depressant. It is. Yes. Yes. Alcohol is interesting because it is a, a, a stimulant and it is a depressant at the same time. Yeah. And, you know, it, interestingly, looking back now, like our alcohol will give you. Um, a hit of dopamine so you're feeling high and um you know and for the first 20 minutes after you take it yeah. but you can get a really good dopamine hit from so many other places and that's why it's not just alcohol that gives you that it could be um shopping um nice food yeah. a hug a walk family sex whatever it might be but yeah. i i noticed actually um Towards the end of my, my drinking sort of career, I'll call it, which went on for way, way too many decades, mm. I noticed that I was actually getting my dopamine hit, not when I put the drink into my mouth, but it was when I reached up into the cupboard to get the glass. Uh, yeah. So before the alcohol came anywhere near me, I was already starting to feel better and happier. Mm. Mm. So that in itself for me was such a huge lesson that alcohol is not the fix yes yeah that's right and then when you stop drinking you have to deal with your feelings as well from a much worse place because yeah. after you've had the dopamine hit mm. um you know other hormones kick in and take you much lower so you're actually coming from a much lower place to try and get back up again yeah. so it's yeah. um yeah it's it's certainly not the be all and the, the fix it that no, we think right. it is. Yes, yeah. that's right. Yeah. Yeah. So we're doing dry July now. Mm, we which are. Is an amazing thing to do. It's great. Mm. But we had a discussion earlier about dry yeah. July and your thoughts on it. I'd love you to share your thoughts on dry July. While I support um, things like um, dry July um, and the other. 30 day challenges that go on throughout the year there's several of them sober october and um and then again in february as well while i support all of that and i think it's really really good um for people to be raising funds yes. or to becoming aware and there's a lot of media around it i personally think it can be quite dangerous because often people particularly if you're binge drinking mm. um it's very easy to give up for 30 days and then have another binge on the 1st of August. Yes. Yeah. And often people will go back to drinking, but drinking more than they were prior to starting this, mm. this time of abstinence, if you like. And often um, um, I, I just don't believe that people 
realize that it's easier to give up alcohol when you're heading towards something good Mm. than it is to be going through the process feeling deprived as though you're missing out. No, I'm doing dry July. No, I'm being good. I'm not doing it. Um, So almost setting themselves up to be deprived of something. Whereas now that I have complete freedom from alcohol, I see very clearly it's so much easier to give up alcohol um, when you're heading towards something good, like waking up of a morning without a hangover, better skin, better sleep, more money in your bank account, um, better relationships with your spouse, um, being able to think clearly, make better decisions. I could go on and on and on, Kate, about the benefits of living alcohol free, which to me is the, it's the carrot. Mm. It's the carrot that I think people need to see rather than the stick of being deprived through 30 day challenges. Yes. And it's seeing alcohol as being bad as well Mm. through the 30 days. Alcohol's bad, yeah. so I'm not going to do it. So I'm depriving myself of this wonderful thing of alcohol that, mm. you know, really makes me feel good most of the time. Um, and then 1st of August comes and it's like open slather. Yeah. 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 So there's it's... really no learning is what you're saying through the dry July because it's an abstinence, abstinence thing rather than a learning thing. Absolutely. And I, you know, my my dearest wish would be that if people are going to do these challenges, they do, they use that time to educate themselves about alcohol, what it actually does to their bodies, what it does to their their minds. And, you know, and and just use the whole process as an educational thing, um, rather than just look at, um, you know, look, look at, what I'm doing, I'm raising money, I'm depriving myself. Um, I'd, I'd rather it much uh, more be used as an educational thing. So, so people actually get lasting change out of it. Yes. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Because it does, because I didn't think of that before you told, before we had that conversation about it's a month of deprivation. And we know, yeah. you know, with diets, if you, um lower your calories restrict your calories you'll always go back to having more and then gaining more weight so it's the same with alcohol you restrict alcohol first Mm. august you're going yes i've done it yeah i'll have you know two cases of beer rather than one or you know what you usually do so yeah i think exercise is a really good analogy because um you know, if you're if you're going to try to quit drinking, um, it's so much easier to move towards something good, as I explained earlier. You know, all the benefits yeah. of living an alcohol-free life. So, yeah. if you're starting an exercise regime, for example, and you don't like running, but hmm. you think, oh, I need to get out of bed every morning and run five kilometers. How often are you actually going to do that? Yes, exactly. Yeah, not very often. If it were no. me, no, if, if at all. <laughs> I know. I know, <laughs> but. But if you find something that you love to do, a sport that you actually do, like swimming, for example, that would get you out of bed. So you're much more likely to do it. So and I think humans are innately wired to go towards something that gives them pleasure rather than away from something that causes them pain. So I, I would like to see things like Dry July be more about the benefits of what you're going to get by not drinking alcohol rather than let's abstain raise some money and be done by the end of the month yes that's right yeah yeah Mm. yeah yes that's such a good discussion to have and to have out there as well for Mm. the um for the people who are organizing the dry july as well thinking Mm. about education as well um, which they do have on their website, I know. They've got a lot of a lot of things, you know, how to, you know, exercise and they've got mm. nutritional things and non-alcoholic drinks, which I'm using because I don't drink and it's like yeah. lemon, lime and bitters gets a bit boring for me or lemonade or whatever. Yeah, I agree. Water. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. they've got a lot of non-alcoholic drinks there, which is great to have. Yeah, and yeah. Like I always, 
because my family's Irish and they're big drinkers. So I always carry a champagne glass with me with bubbly water and a bit of apple juice or whatever juice is around. And it looks like mm-hmm. I'm drinking and they're okay with that. Yeah. So yeah. Like... I mean, that's one of the, that's one of the t- tricks of the trade, I suppose, yeah. if, if you like. Um, one of the things that can be very difficult when, you're, when you've decided to give up drinking mm-hmm. is pressure from other people. Yeah. And um, just being prepared when you're going out into a social situation or even if you're having people into your own home, where anywhere there's going to be drink around, just be prepared. And alcohol-free drinks um, that look look like um you know conventional alcohol drinks like as you're you're saying sparkling water with a bit of apple juice does look like sparkly in your hand it stops people um asking questions yes um and alcoholic drinks they can be a trigger for people as well and yeah. a gateway to going back into into drinking again. So um, I'm not for advocating. I'm not advocating for alcohol-free drinks. You know, for everybody, definitely not. For some, for some people, it's a dangerous, slippery road to go down. Yes, that's right. Yeah. 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 I mean, there's so many yeah. other alternatives out there that don't have to be just alcohol-free drinks that mimic alcohol. Yeah. Um, Etch Sparkling, for example, do a fabulous range of things. Um, Healthy Chef actually do a beautiful loose leaf tea. Um, oh, I can't remember what it's called now. Um, something glow. And just it, it's like a really beautiful berry tea with a bit of vanilla oh. and a bit of rose in it. And, yeah. and that cold with sparkling water, slice of lemon, couple of sprigs of mint. Beautiful. Yeah. Oh, just wow. lovely. Yeah. And easy to make at home. Yes. So, yeah, yeah. That's right. Yes. Yeah. And it's hard, you know, when you've been brought up like me in raised in a alcohol culture, you know, mm-hmm. in the country, you just you have parties from Friday night to Sunday night sometimes. Yeah. And it's all yeah. alcohol. So it's yeah. hard to think outside alcohol, like what else is yeah. out there as well. Yeah. So yeah. yeah. It is very difficult. We um I don't know what your your feed is like um, on Facebook and Instagram, but um, mine's not so bad now because I block everything. But yes. um, in the beginning, um, I remember back to when it was just constantly ads for alcohol and memes and mummy wine culture and oh. here, have kids, it'll make you feel better. Yeah. And we are just constantly bombarded with um, messages about how alcohol adds a benefit to your life. Yeah, and this is where I think education really needs to come into the conversation, because alcohol doesn't give you what it promises in the in the ad or in the big, you know, uh, meme or whatever it might be, or the big shiny bottle. It doesn't fulfil that promise. Yeah, that's right, exactly. And um, you were saying before, like when you give up alcohol too, I'm sure you lose. A lot of friends or a lot of community around you from you know you've been drinking with them you've been happy with them you've been talking with them so how do they talk to you now that you're sober well my drinking was done predominantly in secret at home mm-hmm. um, when I gave up drinking I was living in the Kimberley um, and I was drinking at home um, So, and my family were away. So I didn't go through giving up alcohol with them around me, but I know for people, for other people, it's incredibly difficult. You know, you do lose friends. People don't know what to say to you. Um, You know, I, there, there are friends that I don't hear from anymore and family that don't pick up and call, pick up the phone and call me the way that they used to. Yeah, um, right. that's okay I don't take that on board I think sometimes when you're giving up alcohol um, particularly with friends it's like holding a mirror up yes because you know perhaps they are actually thinking that they're drinking too much as well yeah so take for take for example um, you know this is a just a, a scenario but you know my girlfriend is drinking as much as me we're going out all the time mm. you know we're matching drink for drink and I then identify that I have a problem mm. um, that I need to address I give up drinking 
my friend is obviously very aware we were drinking the same amount. So I've reflected back to her unknowingly that obviously she must have a problem as well. Yes. Now that, right. you know, that that's just a scenario. So that's mm -hmm. a problem that lays that lies firmly with the friend to see it the way that she does. Mm. Um, but I think that's that's where a lot of friendships can come unstuck because you're un, unwittingly reflecting back on somebody else's behaviour. Yes. And, of course, these people, you know, your friends are all being bombarded with the messages of, you know, alcohol is good, yeah. alcohol fixes everything, it's un-Australian, if you don't drink, what's wrong with you, you know, can't yep. trust a man who doesn't drink, all mm -hmm. those messages all yes, coming out. Right, yes, mm. yeah, that's for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So now yeah. you do rural sobriety. So, I do. Yes. Tell me about what you're doing in that. How do you do okay. it? How do I do it? Okay. Yes. Well, it's it started because when, as I said, I was living in the Kimberley and I needed, um, you know, I knew I had a problem. I knew I had a problem 10 years prior. And most people will start to their, question their drinking up to six years before they actually do anything about it that's six years of a lot of damage and a lot of families being destroyed and you know a lot of a lot of hurt happens during that time mm. and I was in the Kimberley by myself my partner was doing FIFO um, so I was just drinking away and then it got to the point where I knew that it was I was on a slippery slope and I could not find any programs that spoke to me as a rural or remote living Australian yes I found plenty of programs online I didn't want to go to AA simply mm. because um who wants to show up in the local church yeah, hall yeah. At eight o'clock on a Tuesday or whatever um and be identified that's right and you know have it coming out if you like in a small community and I didn't yeah. want that and mm. so this was just I this was just prior to COVID before everything went online and we had Zoom. It's different now. So I set about trying to find a program that I could work through uh, confidentially. I couldn't find an Australian based one. So I joined a program called This Naked Mind, which is out of America. And well, first of all, I, I bought the book and two chapters in, I said to my partner, I want to do this program. Yeah. So I joined up, did three months and have not wanted to take a sip of alcohol since. It wow. was completely life-changing because I got the education case. Yes. You know, it wasn't about giving up through deprivation. It was moving towards a better life. Yeah. Um, so I finished the program and was just really getting on with my life. But 25 years ago, when I left every, lost everything back in Ireland, I said to myself at the time, one day I'm going to give back to women just like me that need a hand up. Mm. But in 25 years, I never found that thing. So sitting in the Kimberley, um, having found my sobriety, I knew straight away what I needed to do. It was just something in me I had to do. Yeah. And so um, when I um, received an email inviting me to apply to become a coach with this naked mind, I did the training last mm. year so I set about helping people just like me living in the rural and regional space and remote space in Australia so I've um you know with with their their uh, blessing I've rewritten their programs to speak to people here in Australia so I'm working closely now with Sober in the Country mm -hmm. um to bring the message out to everybody in rural remote and regional Australia that it is okay to say no to a drink yes and that there is help and there is hope out there. So I now offer online programs for uh, in-group coaching, mm -hmm. um, but I also offer one-on-one -on -one, um, coaching programs as well, where I take people through the exact same program that I did, but it's just been reworked and rewritten to be, to be relevant here in Australia, to us here in Australia. Yes. Can anyone do that, the course or the one-on-ones with you? Like do you Absolutely. have to live in rural or remote? 
I, I only work with people in rural, regional and remote, right. um, but I have a very close group of colleagues that I'm more than happy to refer you on to. Great. There's nine of us here in Australia um, that work very closely together. We, we all train together um, right. and we have a, a website, um, Alcohol Coaches Australia, and we all work in different niches yeah. because, um, you know, there's, there's the people drink in different ways. Yeah. So, for example, yeah. I was drinking rural and remotely. Yeah. So, I, you know, I didn't have all of the resources that I need, like yoga classes to distract me or a GP that I could go to or, yeah. or a meeting nearby. So that's, that's what I know. Mm. Um, but my colleagues mm. have their own niches as well. So um, working in fields of, you know, binge drinking, corporate women, uh, the Christian arena, just all sorts of different niches. So yeah. I, if, so if you're not living rural, remote or regional, I'm more yeah. than happy to refer you on to somebody that I would be oh, highly yeah. recommend. Oh, good. Because I'll put I'll put the links in the description of this. Oh, thanks, Kate. Yeah, yeah. That, would, that would be fantastic. Yeah, because since like I wrote an article, a blog post on um, mm. Dry July, before yeah. I'd spoken to you. Actually, I would change it now, but I had quite a few people con email me and say, you know, do you do um, therapy for people who? use alcohol as a self-medication and I actually mm -hmm. don't do it specifically for that I go through mm -hmm. grief and then the alcohol is on top of the grief so we're working yeah. with both so yeah. um I actually referred them to email you to see if you know you thank you everybody so yeah, yeah. but it's yeah. good to know that there's so many out there that could help because I had yeah. probably about five or six people email me and I thought this is wow. amazing. Yeah. 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 I mean, statistics show that, um, you know, and I'm, as I said, specifically focusing on the rural space, um, that only 17% of people in the rural space <laughs> are able to find the help that they need. Yeah. Um, oh, you know, cool. of the high percentage that are looking for help. Yeah. Um, which is just mind blowing mind-blowing there's a lot of good work being being done out there so you know all the coaches in alcohol coaches australia are um trained in the this make naked mind methodology we all gave up drinking using that and um we work very very closely together and we're all about education as well so yes. uh, our, our methodology doesn't stop <coughs> when you put the glass down yeah it actually it goes further on and helps people um navigate a lifestyle going forward yeah know, without alcohol and in amongst all of that i mean one of the main drivers in people drinking obviously is their emotions and what's going on in their lives you know people drink because of in my case to cool pain mm. it could be stress overwhelm <coughs> um, insecurity whatever it might be mm. so there's all sorts of different reasons. So um, I work to uncover what those reasons are and help people deal with those as well. But we specialise just in alcohol. We are alcohol uh, coaches. Yeah, yeah. And that's really good to know. Sorry, I'm coughing because the air you are really hot and <laughs> I'm just dripping off now. So... <laughs> Oh look, there's a lot of it. There's a lot of it around, isn't there, Kate? It's uh, there's a lot of people with with coughs. Yes, but this is overheating. That's all. So, <laughs> <laughs> so oh, look. yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So um, yeah. So it sounds like a wonderful program, and the fact that there are more coaches out there that yeah. deal with all the different types of alcoholism as well the the drinking culture yeah. so yeah, it's yeah, really yeah. good to know and I'd love and I think it's I think it's also you know the background that people mm. have you know yes. um, we've got people who um who specialize um as I said in the Christian community working women um, um people who are more inclined to have a more spiritual sort of aspect to mm -hmm. to to their lives so it's really important when you're looking for a coach to really gel with the person that you're looking to work with yes yes yeah? and that's they've so got to, important 
Yeah, yeah, it is very much so. It's very important to actually have a connection um, because that that's it just makes it easier as you're going through the work yeah. because this is not easy work. Alcohol is a is an addictive substance. Yes. And it's right. it's it's not easy to give up alcohol. Um, or oh, sorry, I should say it's not easy to do the work to help you to give up alcohol because we dig deep into yes. beliefs and thoughts and what yes. your desires are and deal yes. with those. Yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah. Brilliant work. Absolutely. Yeah, it is great work. You know, yeah. my motto is one person, one family at a time. Yes. So, yeah. yeah. Oh, that's great. So where can people get in touch with you and your website and anything else you'd like to add probably the easiest way to get in contact with me is via my website it's mm -hmm. www.ruralsobriety.com.au mm -hmm. um, and I do offer 30 minute um, uh, chat sessions with people I know how hard it is to reach out mm. um, you know that f first step so I'm more than happy to talk to people before they make any commitment uh, before they you know put any money on the table, I really appreciate having the opportunity to talk to people to make sure they are ready to make the step yes. and that I am the right step for them at that time. So um, you can do that via my website. Mm -hmm. um, I'm also on Instagram and Facebook as Rural Sobriety. Um, and I do have my own podcast, again, Rural Sobriety, but that has been a bit quiet for a little bit. <laughs> I'll, I'll be, <laughs> I've, I've had a lot going on, including yes. moving across the country in the last six months. So, but this yes. time I did not move toward away from anything bad at all. Yes. I came back to the East Coast to be closer to family. So, for, so it's for yes. very good reasons. No running away anymore. Um, <laughs> Wonderful. So, yeah. So the podcast has been quiet for the last while, but I'll, you know, I'll, I will be upping that and putting some more episodes out there shortly. Oh, fabulous! Yeah, yeah. because and podcasts are so helpful. I find myself. I, I love, love podcasts. Yeah, because yeah. I've got a half half hour drive to my office, and usually mm -hmm. podcasts are half an hour or an hour. So halfway through, I've done you know I've done a trip and then back home so I've done a whole podcast so or two yeah, which is great when I was living in WA I just recently I um um I was actually binging on um my coach's podcasts oh. I wasn't working with her at the time yeah. but I, I found this amazing lady and I um I actually took the long road round to go to the supermarket so I could get, <laughs> I'd have to drive for an hour rather than 30 minutes. Oh, wow. Um, so I get two episodes in. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> yeah, particularly uh, in the rural you know, because we, there is such a long, long distance but yes. between destinations. Well, yes. I suppose it happens in the city as well when you're stuck in traffic. In traffic. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. I just don't relate to that at all. No, that's right. Yeah, the difference is we don't move. It's like yeah, that's true. you're actually moving, we don't. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I think, you know, things like this, Kate, being able to have discussions like this are so important yes. um, now. And if there is a if there is a silver lining to come out of COVID, maybe this is it. It's yes. the connections that we make and can make easily when the internet doesn't let us down, of course. Yes. <laughs> um, so the connections we can make with people, because the opposite of addiction is connection that's right and yeah. where people are feeling lost and alone and um you know just disconnected it's very easy to find a friend in a bottle yes whereas oh. i'd like to say there is no friend in the bottle mm. reach out just yeah, reach yeah. out to whoever you reach out yeah. to there's always somebody there now who yeah. can help you whether it's online or in person yeah that's so important, mm. Nolene. Oh, it is. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, thank you so much for giving us the time and all this beautiful information, helpful information. And I'm sure you'll be contacted by a lot of people. I certainly hope so. It's just yeah. my dream and mission, and yeah. mission, Kate, to be able to help yeah. as many people as I can. Because I've been there. I know yeah. how hard it is. It's yeah. really, really hard. Yeah, really hard yeah. because you're going against societal norms as well. So. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. 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 So thank you for the chat. It's been yeah. lovely chatting with yeah. you. I do appreciate you letting me natter away. <laughs> Thanks so much, Nolene. <laughs>
Thank you, Kate.